It's Tuesday, October 5th here at the West End Gun Club. Took the day off from work, came out to the range this morning, thought about shooting some rifle in the upper range, but ended up not bringing my gear out with me because I have some things to do midday. I wanted to do run some errands that I can't do on the weekend. So uh, instead of having all that rifle gear on me, I just decided to come out here to shoot some pistol because I need to do some pistol work anyway. I uh, wanted to confirm my zero on the red dot for my Glock 26, which is my carry gun, my primary carry gun. And I uh, wanted to do with it with the hollow points that I usually carry. Um, so I'm going to verify the zero on that, uh, do a little bit of practice with the Glock 19. I also got a new holster for the Glock 19, uh, a G-code holster, and it's outside the waistband, but I'll bust, out in, bust that out in a few. And uh, that's kind of it. And I did bring my cleaning supplies with me just to clean out my gun because uh, since my carry gun, I'm gonna practice with it here, I'm gonna clean it out before I leave the range. Um, I've brought this whole Milwaukee pack out deal with me. So I've been trying to reorganize my cleaning supplies because I have so many cleaning brushes, jags, guides. Um, what else? Uh, bore guides, mops, etc. And so, I found, I saw this, and it's really nice because it's kind of like a tackle box, but not a tackle box. It's by Milwaukee, and it's their packout system, so it like all interlocks together if you get different boxes. This is kind of kind of bulky, in a sense, to fit in like a, a sh on a shelf or a drawer, but I like how it organizes, and if I decide to sort of carry this with me to the range, it does stay intact. And they do sell, I think, a smaller version, which is half the size, which I could probably do. But I'm sort of experimenting with this, and I might actually get the packout system for some of my my uh, shooting supplies, uh, simply because I can throw it into my shed if I want to, because they all interlock together, and I can put them on a rolling cart or whatever, and just put it in my shed or in the corner of the garage. So I'm thinking about that. Anyway, I just grabbed this before I left the house. This was in the garage, and it has all my cleaning supplies, and I do have uh, one pistol, pistol, uh, pistol rod and yeah and some some salt or whatever but anyway i brought that with me and uh set up a couple targets mainly uh two ipsec targets or idpa targets with some pacers on it just for um a sighting reference and that's it so but it's gonna be a casual day today a casual morning rather um just gonna shoot a little bit kind of relax and enjoy the nice morning because it did rain a little bit here in southern california yesterday um, there was some lightning and thunderstorms um, all around the area. It wasn't really heavy, but it was just kind of light and it just it made its way through Southern California. So where I was at, it actually rained. And here I think it rained a little bit. The The dirt is a little bit kind of wet, but it's not like muddy, which is great because it keeps the dust down. It's a nice cool morning and we're now into fall. And from what I can see, the forecast for the rest of the rest of the years should be should be under 90. Thank God, because getting sick of the uh, summer weather in SoCal. I know a lot of people like summer. I frankly just, I like summer too, if it's not over 90 degrees. I mean, which is pretty much every day in in my area of Southern California uh, from like July through September. Anyway, enough talking. Let's go ahead and uh, kind of prep the guns. I need to bust up the ammo and uh, load some mags. If you haven't seen a prior range vlog where I mentioned that I acquired my CCW, I acquired my CCW recently. Um, so it was issued in September for California. And I mentioned a moment ago that my main carry gun is this Glock 26, which is actually a Gen 4, which is not legal for sale in California anymore. Uh, it technically wasn't legal, in sale for Cal or wasn't legal for sale in California even before 2014, 2015, but there was a way to get them uh, purchased from an FFL through a single shot exemption where they pretty much convert it to a single shot before they sold it to you and then you're allowed to convert it to whatever you wanted afterwards. Then California, you know, they removed that law or they, they amended that law so you can't do that anymore. But I did acquire a Gen 4, but, sorry, I, my timer. I think I had a part-time on it, but um. anyway, I didn't actually have it listed on my CCW because you're required to submit the uh, you're required to submit what guns you're going to have on your application or where you're going to carry on your application for CCW, and those are the only ones you're allowed to carry. Uh, but that being said, I didn't actually list it on there initially in my first application because I realized that the gun would be checked against a database to make sure that it's registered to you, which it is. But they're also going to validate the information. And 
when it was drossed by the FFL when it was sold to me, it was actually 25 cal because that's the barrel they used when they sold the gun or when they converted it to single shot. So since it was drossed as a 25 cal, technically it's listed as a 25 cal in the database, the DOJ database. And there is a way to correct that. And the easiest way to do that is simply to do what is called a pawn and return. I found this out on calguns.net. We're basically just pawn the gun for a loan, but then you're getting it back to you because you're going to pay back the loan. But when you do that, the pawn shop is actually an FFL. So when they, when they take a gun from you as a pawn, they have to file, they have to fill out the dross paperwork because they're, they're accepting it from you. And when they do that and return it back to you, that's reissuing it to you. And so that dross back to you, they'll actually put down the correct caliber or cartridge that the gun is chambered in. And then when they put it down as, as nine millimeter, because it is a nine millimeter, now it's updated in the California Department of Justice database as a nine millimeter. Um, it's legal to do that. I mean, it's just how it works. Um, it costs you a little bit because you have to pay for the, you know, obviously the, the dross fee and then your transfer fee or whatever the loan fee that the pound shop wants to charge you. It was a fair price given all things considering. And so I did that. Once I did that, I filed a amendment or modification to my CCW with the Riverside County Sheriff. And I, you know, I, I was going to add this gun. I did and they proved it within the next day. And that was it. And so I, and I got issued the new permit the next day. So now I have this Lock 26, uh, legal for carrying California. And I'm probably going to get a Gen 3, to be honest. I think the Gen 3s are better than the Gen 4s in general, or at least the, out of the sampling of two that I have. I do actually have three Gen 4s, two Glock 19 Gen 4s, and then one Glock 26 Gen 4. But I actually never fired one of those Glock 26, or Glock 20, 19s, rather. It's a full FDE, brand new, never fired. The only thing I ever did with it was like titanium nitride coated the barrel. But that thing is mint, and I've never shot it. I kind of want to just sell it or trade it for something. I kind of want a Glock 43, and the prices for a Glock 43 in California are insane. Insane. I think they go for about 1200 and people are paying 1200 for it, in which I can't imagine paying twice as much as retail, even if we can't get them here. Because you can legally get it from another person who legally acquired for someone else. So that's basically how we're getting those off-roster guns. Anyway, I don't want to pay 1200 for it. I thought about trading my, my uh, Gen 4 Glock 19 FDE. I'm sure it'll fetch you know, something considering it's brand new. And I also have a Surefire X300 Ultra Light for it, also an FDE. So it's kind of cool looking for all those people who want to just collect guns. Uh, but I don't know. Anyway, that being said, I'll get back to the point. Um, I think the Gen 3 is actually better than the Gen 4 so in the small sampling that I have. Um, the Gen 3 is I can just, you just feel better well, the Gen 4 out of the box feels better, but the trigger on the Gen 3 out of the box is better. Uh, I like the, you know, the RTF style stippling on the Gen 4s. Um, but with the Gen 3, all I do is just shave off the finger grooves and I shave and I just add some grip tape on the front side of the grip and it works great. And that's how my Glock 19 is set up, which is in the Jeep. Anyway, um, I'm going to go ahead and shoot a few rounds with the... Uh, at 10 yards with uh, Hornady, what is this ammo? Hornady Critical Defense, this is Hornady Critical Defense, 115 grain FTXs. So, um, it's kind of what I have. Uh, trying these out, or it's kind of the new, new hollow point defensive round that I'm, I'm using in my guns. Before it was kind of those Winchester SXTs, I think, uh, which are basically the rebranded or renamed Black Talons. Uh, but I don't know. Kind of the FTXs seem pretty cool in terms of the technology. They fill the hollow point with a rubber, you know, whatever polymer filling they do, so it, you don't like damage the, the hollow point tip. It seemed cool off the marketing, so that's why I tried to go with them or decided to go with these. I'm a terrible shot, so I don't know why I'm shooting free-handed or off-handed instead of off a bench, but we'll try to zero here. That was me. That was definitely me. Okay. Put three rounds. I know I, I sh I've pulled left on the first one, and the second one I definitely jerked it. Third one was a clean shot. Put two more rounds here. Okay. 
uh, six rounds. Now, if we take a quick look at this, I think uh, I definitely jerked these two. This is like first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. I can probably come over left, maybe two clicks or a click to kind of bring this in. I know for a fact I'm favoring left, but I'll try to shoot a little slower, but I think moving over right one or two clicks will be beneficial. Throwing these rounds really bad. Got one round still in the chamber. That one definitely went, I knew I went down. Didn't think I pulled right, but it's 10 rounds there. I'm gonna go ahead and shoot another group here. Through that one bad. So I actually think the first shot went way high, which is disgusting. But um, it looks like my windage is okay. Um, I pulled this one for sure. But again, I'm not the best pistol shot especially from the short, or from the Gen 4 triggers, but this looks good, I think. We'll leave it at that, and I'm gonna shoot some at the 25 out there, and uh, we'll see how I, how the zero is, but assuming my elevation's okay, I, maybe I'll come up one click. I'll, maybe I'll come up one click just for, for fun, and then we'll shoot at the 25. Gonna try to put some rounds on, tar on target at 25. Still pulling left. That one should have been good. It felt good. That one probably went low. Put four rounds on. So, this is definitely me. I'm pulling them to the left. This is the best shot that I felt good. I knew it was good. These three, I just felt pretty sloppy. So I need to work on my trigger pull with this Gen 4. I shot a couple dozen more rounds off camera with the uh, G26. I think we're okay. So I'm just gonna go ahead and run through a cleaning right now. Um, do I have any mats with me here? Uh, so basically I'm just gonna, since I uh, carry this gun, I kinda wanna clean it after some range practice. Everybody knows how to strip a Glock. If I can, uh, oh, it would help if you actually uh, pull the trigger. I can drop that, drop that. I just do a basic cleaning, which is nothing too spectacular here. Um, generally, just is it all on? Yeah, it's on camera, kind of on camera. I can just turn this a little bit, maybe. There you go, centered up, kind of. So, I usually just clean the slide out in the barrel and then just wipe down the frame. Uh, slides, pretty pretty simple. I usually just wipe out most of the debris dry first. Um, I do use frog lube. I know a lot of people don't like frog lube. Um, actually, it has its uses. There's some lubricants that are better, obviously, for certain applications, but I think for a carry gun, like a pistol, a non-toxic lubricant or preservative is probably ideal. Um, something because it's going to be on your skin and whatnot. I would not use this in an AR-15. I would not use it in a bolt gun. I tried it, and in general, off of a 
on a bolt gun, especially if you use it inside your bolt, it's gonna gum up and you're gonna have light strikes. So I, I did that with my bolt with the firing pin. I coated the whole bolt with the uh, frog loop and what ended up happening was in the colder weather, it gummed up and I got light strikes. AR-15 is okay, to be honest, um, but I can only imagine that in colder weather, it would be a problem uh, for some auto cycling. But in a pistol, as long as you're not coating, you're not, as long as you're not just, I don't know, packing it all in here, you should be fine. Um, having any problems even in cold weather with frog loop. And again, non-toxic or whatever. Uh, and it doesn't like oil all over the place. If it does, it's not, it shouldn't be an issue on your skin. Anyway, um, just wiping out most of the debris here and the fouling and uh, kind of just cleaning the, uh, the flame rails or whatever. Just got to get that out. And I do have a brush in my kit or whatever, but I'm just wiping down most of it first and then we'll just use a brush to uh, clean off the larger bits. But aside from that, I don't know if you're going to watch this all on camera. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to, I'm just going to run through a cleaning uh, and let the barrel soak a little bit. So what I usually do is um, I've used Empro 7. I just put, I buy it by the gallon or whatever and put it into a spray bottle and I'll usually just spray down spray down like the frame a little uh, slide and then the inside of the barrel. Sorry, there's a gun like GMS radio. You're loud and clear, buddy. Well, I'm actually getting, a, actually getting some reception there. I don't think I transmit though. Anyway, let me turn that off. So I don't record somebody's conversation on the video. Uh, so I'll usually soak the Pro 7, but what I have been trying out is this stuff called C4 from Bortec. This is actually pretty good stuff to remove carbon fouling. Um, I use Rimfire Blend for the Rimfire, but what I've been, I'm going to try to do if I really need to get it clean is I'll use Rimfire Blend and Rimfire Gun, and then use C4 Carbon Remover to clean out like the uh, carbon ring. But what I found this does really good at, it does really uh, clean copper really well, but I do use it in my Model 642, the cylinders of the revolver, and this stuff cleans it out incredibly well. Like it pulls so much carbon out of the cylinders. So I'm going to use this on the barrel as well after I use the Empro 7. I don't use a copper cleaner in a pistol, to be honest. I just use Empro 7, which is a good all-purpose cleaner. Um, but I'm going to let that soak, and I'm going to brush it out. I'm going to pull a brush, brush that, and then patch it, and then brush it again or whatever, and then go at it with carbon, the C4 carbon remover. Anyway, I'm going to do that off camera because I don't want to. I mean, it's just going to be boring watching me clean. So, Or maybe I can just do that, and I'll just uh, I'll go ahead and clean on camera, but I'll just time-lapse it. Just to slow it down a little bit, I did want to mention that cleaning with the uh, red dot sights can be kind of a pain because you know if you try to brush the you know the breech face or the uh, the bolt face you want to call it, the slide face of the slide where the firing pin is or the striker is at, you're gonna get like a lot of splash back or spray back on the on the lens, but kind of try to cover it up if you can. But then you may just have to use an alcohol wipe to clean that off. Um, it is what it is, just the nuance with red dot sights or micro red dot sights on pistols and maintenance. While I'm waiting for that C4 carbon remover to soak in that barrel, I'm going to try out this new holster. This is a G-Code, um, this is a drop holster. I can't remember the, the model number, but I have a drop, I guess it was a drop leg holster. This one's just kind of a low low offset holster, which is kind of what I really wanted. Um, I don't think they made this until recently. Maybe I just totally missed it, but this is kind of what I wanted. The drop leg holster was just too low for me. I'm a short guy anyway, and so it just runs really low on my leg, and I don't like that. Anyway, it's got this, their RTI interface, and basically the premise is you have these RTI interfaces on their holsters, and you just lock it in place. But anyway, let's go ahead and get this on. Um, I'm actually gonna, I'm also looking at going to battle belts. I never really got into the whole battle belt thing, but then I realized the, the versatility and how useful it is. So the battle belt, basically you have an inner belt then a second outer belt and it goes over that. And so your, your, your inner belt is just that it's got loop. Uh, so it's got loop on the outside, like Velcro loop on the outside. And then the battle belt 
outer belt goes over that and it hooks onto it using Velcro hook. And then um, it buckles in the, the middle. But I was thinking about getting one of those and I'll keep this mounted on the, the outer belt and then I'll just, you know, use an inner belt for like kind of EDC or whatever. And if I need to, when I go to the range, I can just get that belt on. And, you know, it has Molly on the, on the outer belt so you can put Molly attachments for the magazines. And um, I think I got the idea from sort of a Wamfats channel. Matt, he used, I think he uses his own battle belt for his PRS or NRL uh, rimfire. And what is rimfire shooting? He has it set up. And I kind of like the idea. I've been kind of sticking to uh, kind of just belt hook type thing. So I don't have to put on, like I don't have to loop stuff through a belt. I just quickly put it over and that's it. But I like the idea of having just be able to put on the belt, like so I can have like two magazine holsters, like AICS mag holsters, and my my pouch for my rangefinder, pouch for my uh, Kestrel. Just have it all on there and just put it on, right? And it seems like it's it'll be interesting. It'll like be a nice way to just kind of get stuff on and get stuff off, you know, on before, after, and during a match. So then that would mean that I would kind of run two belts, like just get one inner and two outers. So have one set up for, for pistol shooting and one set up for, for rimfire NRL 22 type stuff. Anyway, so this thing kind of just hooks on and this is, I'm still running an Aries. Um, this is a Ranger belt, I think. They don't make these anymore. And I, I, I like it, it's great, but for uh, uh, appendix carry, IWB, it's not perfect. It's just like any other belt where you have to offset the buckle to the left to, to get good appendix carry. Um, so I'm also looking for another EDC belt, and I was looking into brands like Core, 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 Core Belts, K-O-R-E. Um, they make their own belts, which look pretty good, but anyway. So I have this set up like this. So it's kind of offset. It's not too low, but it's it's high enough so when I wear a plate carrier, it's not going to hit my hit my plate carrier. Anyway, this is actually a loaded gun, um, so should I kind of be a little bit careful in terms of my uh, my discipline here? But uh, so this is also on my my G19 Gen 3 is also on my carry list. But anyway, from a range standpoint, what I'll do is just put it on the RTI here. Um, actually, is it locked in place? Sorry. So I, as the interface goes, just put it on, hook it in, press in, it's locked in. So you're good to go there. And this one's hooked up for my my G19 Gen 3 with the X300 Ultra. And it's inleted for suppressor sights. So anyway, this does kind of move, which is what I expected, but with a battle belt, they, I think this inside is lined a little bit. I'm not entirely sure, so that it could prevent it from moving around. Actually, it's not lined. Yeah, there's a little bit of lining on the, on the inside of the, the loop. So that's supposed to interface better with sort of those quote unquote battle belts so that they, it'll grip better. Um, but we'll try to make, try to get this broken in today because it's the, uh, retention still kind of tight. I tried to loosen it a little bit, but I didn't want to loosen it too much. And I think it's good to have a little bit of retention here, but I'll, I might actually go ahead and try to loosen it up just a tad. I've messed around with it a little bit, but I don't know. I think we'll live with this. I think it's good to have good retention for these, for this kind of leg holster. Anyway, let's go ahead and actually... What do I have in here? These are hollows. These are critical duties. But I'm gonna go ahead and load some mags with. Uh, am I chambered? On? I'm not chambered on this one. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and load some mags with just generic uh, white box Winchester, and we'll shoot some rounds on paper.
So interesting thing when I rack the slide on a red dot, I kind of, instead of overhanding, I have the tendency to grip it like this. Um, don't know why, it's just a habit. I need to break it. I've been doing that as of late. I need to learn just to grip the red dot sight and rack it as opposed to gripping the, kind of like a brass check. I need to stop doing that. Initial impressions on this G-code uh, lower offset holster, I, sorry, for the life of me, I cannot remember the name of the holster, but it's kind of a drop offset holster. I do like it. Right now, the way I have, I'm running it today, it does have a tendency to pull forward because of the way I, my draw stroke will cause the holster to, to slowly push, you know, like that, right? So it's moving on my body. But I kind of want to keep it to this side. Um, it's not too bad if I keep it slightly less than three o'clock but ideally i just want to stay in one place so i'm hoping that if i do run on a battle belt that should keep that should stay in place a lot better um but in general i like it it's not too low and it's perfectly offset below the plate line where my plate carrier would be so i have plenty of clearance if there was something there i have ample room to op operate i guess on my right side so i do like this and um, I'm kind of bought into the G-code system, so this RTI system, um, I can, if I need to, I can move this to another platform, and I have something coming in soon with regards to my EDC, um, where th something like this will actually interface with, so um, maybe, in, maybe in another three or four weeks, I should be able to show you what exactly, um, like another way I'm using RTI attachments, so the RTI is kind of proprietary to G-code. Um, but these RTI interfaces, um, but they're pretty handy. And so I don't think I brought my, I didn't bring my other one. So I have one that's for the G17, which is what I use my drop leg holster. That's, that'll work for a G17 and a G19 without a light. So if I need to run without a light, I can do so in that other, that other, uh, holster and it'll hook up to the same RTI attachment wheel. So. It does give me some versatility for these outside the waistband type um, platforms or scenarios. So I do like this um, sort of save money, I guess, in terms of you can have the same attachment platform, but you can swap out the actual holster itself. Anyway, I'm liking this setup. We'll see how this goes. I'm and I also need to break it in a little bit because you can see some of the Kydex is getting, getting eaten away right here, but that's to be expected kind of want that to happen so I'm putting it through the uh, draw stroke type iterations here to kind of help break it in and sometimes I put oil in there or like even frog lube perhaps just to get it kind of slick inside kind of helps it wear in but I don't need to do that I've gotten some repetitions here that'll help kind of break it in so anyway do you like that fits perfectly well anyway I'm gonna go ahead and uh finish cleaning up the G26. Um, then I'm going to go into the condensed container to take a look at a couple things. Anyway, I have to put back my, my target stands in the condensed container anyway, since that's where I pulled them out from. And it's kind of handy to be um, sort of a match director here in so far as I can keep <laughs> some of my gear here. I do use those target stands for the NRL 22 matches because when we set up the zero stages, or the, sorry, the zeroing period, I use my own target stands just so I didn't buy any f using club money and I didn't get reimbursed for it. I just use my own stands and I leave them here. Um, so it's nice just to keep them here and I keep a lot of my targets in there because a lot of, actually a lot of those NRL 22 targets, they're all mine. They're like not bought by the club. They're just my own personal, but I keep them in the contents container so I don't have to truck it back and forth between home and here since we're running the matches here. Might as well just leave them here. And uh, anyway, what I was getting, my point is, is just handy to have my my stands here on site so I don't have to 
constantly carrying around with me uh, to and from the range. And uh, But while I'm in the condensed container putting in the stands, I'm going to take a look at a few things for the NRL 22 match. And that's sort of it for, for now. But let me go ahead and get cleaned up, and then we'll wind things down here and uh, do the outro. Picked up all my brass, finished cleaning up my gun. Going to put those in the container and uh, going to get out of here. As far as my carry is concerned, I'm still... I, I carry very infrequently um, in the past because, you know, my carry permits were from basically non-resident Florida, non-resident Arizona. So mostly it was carrying in Nevada. And I was always using my INCOG, the uh, INCOG slash G-code holster, which is just a appendix carry type single clip type deal. And it worked relatively well. I'm still trying to get used to it from an EDC standpoint. I think it could be better. It's not terrible. I was looking into running something like the tier one, tier one holster where it's got the uh, sidecar where you have both the, the magazine and the holster, the gun and one piece. But the thing is, I'm not entirely sure if I want to have them married together. I think I like having the versatility of being able to move my mag holster around my body. And if you notice how here I have my gig line center line, um, traditionally you would put the two clips between your two in the center but in here I would kind of offset it to the left of my body simply the way my body is I'm kind of a small person so in order to conceal it better and for more comfort it's better to have the gun more to the center and the magazine off to the, the offset to the left and so I think having the the mag holster and the holster itself for the gun separated allows me that versatility there um, some people argue against that but we're, we're I'm still experimenting so I don't know, it, it's expensive to buy these holsters, right? Because you're talking $100, you know, give or take, plus, you know, give or take 20, 40 bucks, uh, depending on which holster you're gonna get. And so it's expensive to tr keep trying all these different holsters. I mean, you can try to sell them, but all due respect, I don't know if I wanna buy a used holster, which has got some guy's groin sweat all over it. I mean, sure, you can clean it off, but I mean, it's just that mental thing, right? <laughs> anyway, um, this is how I'm carrying like today, right now. And it, it conceals relatively well. I'm, some will argue that you can kind of see, hey, it looks like there's something under your shirt. But I'm like, you got to stare at it and know what you're looking at. Because if I took this holster out, it would, my shirt would still break the same way just because of the way the shirt is. It just looks like I have something underneath my shirt. And it's just the way my shirt falls. I mean, and you kind of have to keep, have to be more weary of like, more cognizant of what kind of shirt I wear on a given day because it could affect how it's perceived in public, right? But for the most part, I should be fine. I could afford to lose about 15 pounds though, and it might help me, oh, 15 pounds around the gut, who knows? Um, but I could afford to lose a little bit around the gut to make this a little bit better. Um, but that's how it's gonna run for, for the time being until I start experimenting with other holsters. If you have any ideas for holsters, let me know. Although, like I said, it's, I mean, there's so many things out there. I read all the web, web resources. It's just expensive to keep buying holsters. So uh, with that being said, let's go ahead and call it a day. I hear some choppers flying around. I'm sure they're just doing like fire patrol or whatever. Um, but to that's it for today, Tuesday, October 5th, here at the West End Gun Club. Thanks for watching. See you in the next vlog.